In retrospect, it is easy to brush off the success of the air campaign during Operation Desert Storm as a given, as the expected result of the world's leading powers bringing their military might to bear against Iraq. However, the staggering number of aircraft and munitions available to the coalition would have meant nothing without expertly crafted military planning. Its effectiveness came from how efficiently those assets were used, what they were used against, and the impact that the destruction of their targets had on Saddam's war machine. On the first night of the war, the coalition struck more individual targets than the entire USAAF in its 1942-43 bombing campaign against Germany. At the height of the campaign, coalition warplanes and support aircraft were flying over 3,000 missions a day, all without a single mid-air collision or friendly fire between aircraft. As a feat of administration, this is impressive in its own right, but it must also be remembered that the campaign was conducted against the fourth largest military in the world, with eight years of combat experience against Iran, which also possessed one of the most sophisticated air defence networks outside of the Soviet Union. It was the skill and acumen of planning staff at the Tactical Air Control Centre, and those who supported them at the Pentagon, and other command centres, which made Desert Storm possible. The United States Armed Forces operates in several geographically based joint commands, to allow all branches to work together under one unified chain of command, defined by the theatre they operate in. So, as Kuwait fell to Iraqi forces, responsibility for the crisis fell to Central Command, or CENTCOM, headquartered at McDill Air Force Base in Florida, and its commander, US Army General Norman Schwarzkopf. Schwarzkopf's Air Force subordinate was Lieutenant General Chuck Horner, who held the position of Commander, Central Command Air Forces, or CENTAF, but once in theatre in Saudi Arabia, Horner became the Joint Force Air Component Commander, or JFAC, with authority over all coalition air assets assigned to the region. It was up to Chuck Horner, his subordinates and select planners in the US to orchestrate the air campaign. In a sense, planning for the air war had begun months before Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. CENTCOM had wargamed a hypothetical Iraqi invasion of Saudi Arabia as part of exercise internal look, and so had done much of the initial groundwork insofar as target lists and force deployment was concerned. On the 8th of August, on orders of the Vice Chief of Staff, a dormant joint Air Force, Navy, Marine planning team in the Pentagon, codenamed Checkmate, headed by Colonel John Warden, was brought to life. Warden's team developed the initial offensive plan, Operation Instant Thunder, in less than two weeks, presenting it to Norman Schwarzkopf and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Colin Powell, before flying out to Saudi Arabia to work with Horner directly at Sentaf on the 19th of August. CENTAF headquarters was eventually established at the Tactical Air Control Center, or TAC, in Riyadh. Like their US Army counterparts, the headquarters staff of CENTAF were determined not to repeat the mistakes of the Vietnam War. The first of these was to avoid the gradual escalation in strikes that epitomized Operation Rolling Thunder, which led to militarily important targets being intentionally left unscathed in a vain attempt by the Johnson administration to coerce North Vietnam without escalating the war. As the name suggested, Instant Thunder was the exact opposite. It called for immediate and widespread attacks against key Iraqi military and government targets. Horner, however, balked that two more Vietnam-era mistakes had been repeated. Firstly, Instant Thunder divided up strikes by the US Air Force, Navy and Marines geographically, as had been done in Vietnam. Horner on the other hand wanted to keep the US and Allied air arms as integrated and seamless as possible. Secondly, during Rolling Thunder, decisions regarding air operations were made unusually high up the chain of command, with the Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and even President Johnson making operational and even tactical level decisions despite having nearly no expertise or experience in the realm of air combat. Furthermore, such micromanagement meant the entire command system was disjointed and less efficient, further hindering Rolling Thunder's effectiveness. Horner desperately wanted to keep such decision-making within CENTAF command staff to preserve efficiency and prevent unnecessary political interference. He made this particularly clear on one occasion, shouting at Schwarzkopf that 
We ain't picking the goddamn targets in Washington. Schwarzkopf agreed. Before planning an air campaign, a few assessments must be made. The first is what's termed operational environment research. Brace yourself for the eye-rolling that accompanies a Sun Tzu quote. Know the enemy and know yourself, and in a hundred battles you will never be in peril. Operational environment research is simply research of the enemy, the theatre, environment and allied forces. Reasonably accurate and honest estimates of both enemy and friendly capabilities are the basic foundation for all later planning. To understand how the enemy perceives the situation and in turn how they are likely to act, planning staff consider both the domestic politics of the nation in question and the international relations of the enemy or friendly state. Furthermore, staff are encouraged to analyse relevant history, regional geopolitics and relevant cultural or religious considerations to help understand the adversary. As far as allies were concerned, Horner had previously visited many of the Gulf states and met many of his counterparts in the Royal Saudi Air Force and other allied Arab air arms. Thus, he knew their capabilities, culture and political concerns. Again, the internal look exercise had done much of the legwork for Iraq. The United States assessed that Iraq possessed 718 fighter aircraft, including some of the most formidable Soviet aircraft available, the MiG-29A Fulcrum and the MiG-25PD Foxbat, as well as modern French-built Mirage F1EQs and substantial numbers of older, yet still dangerous, MiG-23 Floggers and MiG-21 Fishbed variants. However, Iraq's main defence against a coalition air campaign was the Kari Air Defence Network. Constructed with the help of French arms company Thompson CSF, Kari broke down Iraqi airspace into four sectors, each with their own sector operation centre, to which several intercept operation centres were linked. These in turn coordinated their assigned surface-to-air missile batteries. These operation centres were in underground bunkers linked to one another by buried fibre optic cables. All were linked back to the main operation centre in Baghdad. Kari also gave the Iraqi Air Defence Force a way to operate their usually separate Soviet and Western-made SAMs and radar systems in conjunction with one another. Assigned to the Kari system were over 90 Soviet-made SAM batteries, primarily the SA-2 Guideline and SA-3 Goa, but the particularly deadly Iraqi Army SA-6 Gainful mobile surface-to-air missiles were also integrated into the network. Particularly important targets such as air bases and government buildings tended to be guarded by the Franco-German Roland missiles and captured Kuwaiti SA-8 geckos. On top of all this were the thousands of short-range air defence systems such as the SA-13 Gopher, shoulder-launched manpads and massive quantities of anti-aircraft guns which en masse still posed a serious threat to aircraft operating at low altitudes. The multi-layered, redundant, computer-controlled air defence system around Baghdad was denser than that surrounding most Eastern European cities during the Cold War, and several orders of magnitude greater than that which had defended Hanoi during the later stages of the Vietnam War. Having assessed the theatre and the balance of forces, planners and commanders must decide what is to be achieved. Determination of objectives is fairly straightforward in concept, though more difficult in practice. Simply, a desirable end state must be identified, the liberation of Kuwait. Later, secondary objectives were added, such as the destruction of the Iraqi Republican Guard, to weaken Saddam Hussein's grasp on power, which was not as clearly defined or as effectively achieved as the main objective. With those broad objectives in mind, it must be decided how to achieve them. Colonel John Warden of the Checkmate Planning Cell had his own theory of how this should be done, targeting enemy centres of gravity. A centre of gravity is a source of power that provides moral or physical strength, freedom of action, or will to act. Warden identified several key centres of gravity that needed to be struck and visualised these centres as concentric rings. He believed that the benefit of air power was that you could attack these rings from the inside out or simultaneously, unlike conventional ground forces. These centres of gravity, therefore, gave planners the types of targets that need to be struck, 
and Warden's theory provided the order in which they should be dealt with. Following this, the Air Campaign's objectives were 1. Establish air superiority 2. Isolate and incapacitate the Iraqi leadership 3. Destroy Iraq's nuclear, biological and chemical warfare capability 4. Eliminate Iraqi offensive military capability and 5. Eject the Iraqi army from Kuwait With these considerations, a final master attack plan was created. Over the months of Desert Shield, the target lists evolved through several iterations and the finer points of the plan changed. But by December of 1990, it totaled 237 targets, including command centres for the Kari Air Defence Network, airfields, Scud and Al Hussein missile launch sites, Iraqi government and armed forces headquarters, chemical weapons storage facilities, power plants, Iraqi forces in the field, and many others. This targeting information was combined with all other air operations into its final form, the Air Tasking Order, or ATO. General Chuck Horner would later say, As JFAC, I had to live and die by the quality of my ATO planning and execution. The ATO was the expression of my command. The ATO was a document issued to the entire force, usually three days in advance. It comprised a list of all the sorties to be flown, which targets were to be struck, when and by whom. Tanker and surveillance aircraft circuits, combat air patrols, fighter sweeps and strike packages were all included. The creation of strike packages was a critical part of the ATO. Strike aircraft such as US Air Force F-16s or RAF Tornadoes were assigned to a target. To that flight of strike aircraft, fighters from other squadrons or units were assigned to provide escort and sweep ahead of the strike element. Finally, more aircraft, both escort jammers like the EF-111 and suppression of enemy air defences aircraft armed with anti-radiation missiles, rounded out the force, defending it from the SAM threat. With the planning being only three days in advance, issues could arise if the tasking order was delayed, which was one of the contributing factors to the package queue debacle. But typically this allowed for squadron commanders and representatives of coalition air forces to suggest changes to the ATO while being short enough that lessons learned from previous days could be integrated rapidly. On the 15th of January 1991, the deadline for Iraq's withdrawal from Kuwait came and went. President George H. W. Bush authorised coalition forces to remove the Iraqi army from Kuwait by force. At midday local time on the 16th of January, Sentaf issued a coalition-wide warning order, Execute Wolf Pack, setting the air war in motion. The 596th Bomb Squadron, based at Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana, received its launch order, and seven of its B-52 bombers, each laden with secretive AGM-86C cruise missiles, lumbered skyward, bound for war. At air bases and aircraft carriers across the Middle East, over 1,500 Allied combat aircraft and their pilots were readied for action, to venture into the teeth of one of the most advanced air defence networks in the world. General Horner and the rest of Sentaf waited apprehensively, glued to the air picture provided by five AWACS aircraft on screens in the Tactical Air Command Center. Months of planning led to this moment. Operation Desert Storm began. 